Bloom and Grow YouTube show. What is an essential oil? That's a really good question and one that often gets a lot of um, misconceptions about it. So an essential oil or really a distilled essence is kind of exactly that. It, it, it is, you know, an extraction of uh, certain metabolites that the plant makes that often gives either the scent that we need or a desired medicinal or physical property, right? So for example, we extract rose oil from roses. Um, usually it's the fragrance that we want, but there could also be you know, other compounds that we're looking for. When you think of an essential oil, you know, you think of one thing like, oh, this one thing is the true essence of the plant. When in reality, essential oils are made up of many, many, many different compounds and chemicals that the plant produces. Um, you know, there is no one, it, except in very rare and unique circumstances, there is no one chemical compound that is, you know, the essence of the plant or the essential oil of the plant. Essential oils are made up of a bunch of things, like even you know, the essence of lemon or the essence of citrus still has other compounds in it. Although I will say citrus in particular is a mild exception to that where limonene, literally named after lemons, limonene is the major component in, um, you know, citrus essences. But there are other uh, chemical compounds that are in there as well that the plant produces. So that's sort of when, what, yeah. So when you say essence, is it a vapor? Is it when you're squeezing a lemon and it's the lemon juice, like what actually is the essence that we're talking about for essential oils? For, for most intents and purposes, it's typically the, the oil itself or the things that are not the juices. So, so something that can remind you of the plant, it, it's sort of, it's sort of what you want it to be mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of, cause you know, you can extract many things from the plant. So it's, it's really like, do you want the fragrance of the plant? Do you want the medicinal properties of the plant? You know, because each of those are different essences and each of those you can make different tinctures and other potions and whatnot from. So, you know, could you consider the juice an essence, I guess, but mm -hmm. most people are, are concerned with the oils and the fragrances and the fragrances are typically in volatile compounds that are contained within the oils. Although it's, there can be some, portions of the juice that contain essence, you know, quote unquote essence as well. So in my mind, it's something that reminds you of that plant without the plant really even being there. So for example, like mint oil, right? It smells like mint. It makes you think of mint, even though it's just the oil from the mint plant and not the mint plant itself. So that's sort of my definition for what an essential oil is. Okay. I love that. You know, I've taken so many classes at the New York Botanical Garden and you've never been my teacher. We've always missed each other. Um, um, but I took what class was it? It was either tree communication or intro to plant science where we learned about VOCs. Yep. I dove deeper into VOCs for research for my book. And the thing that really shocked me was, you know, everything that we smell, like all of the smells that we associate with plants are actually VOCs, volatile organic compounds, which are methods of communication for the plants. That's right. That's absolutely 100% right. Either they're methods of communications or there's some other kind of chemical signal, whether or not they um, are good signals or bad signals. They could attract, uh, sometimes their goal is to attract pests. Sometimes their goal is to attract pollinators, uh, repel pests, I mean, uh, attract pollinators. Sometimes the fragrance has no impact on the plant. It just happens to smell that way. And plants produce these fragrances and these compounds for many, many reasons. And so... You know, for example, if you think of an orange, right, staying on that citrus trend, right, mm -hmm. the essence of orange or the essence of citrus, right, if you take essential lemon oil or essential orange oil, before you even think about that, think about an orange, think about an orange you've left on your counter for days, weeks, possibly even months, I know at least once in your life, you've left an orange out on the counter for a questionable amount of 100%, time. 100%, 100%. Most other fruits like a grape or something else would probably have rotten by then if they didn't dry out terribly first, right? An orange doesn't really rot. Have you ever really seen an orange rot? Maybe once in a while, it'll get like a little blue green fungus. But other than that, compared to other fruits, an orange doesn't really rot. And that's because of the antimicrobial properties of the 
essence of orange oil. The orange oil, the lemon oil, lemons don't really go bad either. They stay fresh for, I mean, air quotes, fresh for a long, long time. And that's because of the antimicrobial properties of limonene and the other um, compounds that are in the essential oil lemons. So, you know, when you think of essential oils, the plants produce essential oils for themselves, right? Plants don't produce really anything for us except for maybe fruits. They want us to eat the fruits to disperse their seeds. They don't actually want to feed us. They just want us to bite, chew, mm -hmm. disperse seeds. So there are other properties too, right? Just like volatiles are used for communication. Ethylene is a gas. That's why you could put apples in a bag, one ripe apple in a bag with a bunch of unripe apples and tomatoes and the ethylene gas signals to those other apples and um, tomatoes to start ripening. And that's what they will do. And there are other compounds too that produce, a, a, that are used for a wide variety of things by the plant. So for example, the smell of freshly cut grass. Oh, my favorite one. Smell of freshly more. cut grass, yes. Um, I, I might horrify you, but that's actually the grass screaming for help. Uh, that's that volatile. The smell of fresh cut grass is actually grass telling other plants nearby, "Yo, beware. we just got beware. We just got attacked by an herbivore. We just got cut in half. We don't know what happened, but like, batten up the defenses." And there are many scientific papers where they will induce, you know, quote unquote pain, or they'll like damage a plant, and then they'll measure the immune, quote unquote, immune response. I'm using very big air quotes right now mm -hmm. um, of the plants that are just nearby that only have exposure to the gas from the other plant and nothing else. Mm -hmm. They can't see the other plant. They put like a barrier in between. The other plants upregulated and produced more defensive compounds and produced more anti-herbivory anti -herbivory metabolites in order to like try to not get eaten in the best way that they plantily can. So, um, super fascinating Amazing. stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's just interesting to think, especially I'm a, I'm a big believer in essential oils. I love mm -hmm. scents. actually after doing the research for this book, I've been really exploring my scent relationship with plants more because I think as plant people were more visual and we don't understand the power of scent and our olfactory system. Um, but it's interesting to think about how plant scents are way more than just something to make our bathroom smell nice, you know? And, yeah. you know, I was hyper aware of it as, you know, I planted my first garden outdoors this year as I moved to the country mm -hmm. and I'm completely, you know, we have so much deer and figuring out the deer resistant plants, but the deer resistant plants are the plants that have certain scents. It's salvias, lavender, marigolds. Mm -hmm. It's that specific scents that deer don't like. And right. it's just very interesting to think about how clever plants can be by creating those, those scents themselves. Um, what were you yeah. saying? Yeah, exactly. No, a hundred percent. Right. And you know, there's also other things that, you know, plants might make sense and have things that have unintended consequences, right? Like for example, basil, you and I, like, I'm a big fan of basil. I think you're also a big fan mm -hmm. of basil too. Mm -hmm. Basil oil, basil produces that oil to be antimicrobial, to be antifungal, but inadvertently it ends up attracting a bunch of certain insects, particularly plant pests. Basil gets demolished. Also, have you noticed how certain plants are pest magnets and other plants pests don't really bother that much? That's because of other volatiles certain pests based on the way that they've evolved have receptors for certain types of volatiles. And if the plant produces it, they gravitate towards it. And if the plant doesn't produce it, then they don't really see that plant. Like they might visually perceive, Hey, there's a plant there, but they might think, ah, oh, that doesn't look too appetizing. I'm going to go over here where this other plant smells much more appetizing. So that's why you'll get like for the indoor growers, right? You'll have something like a ficus. Oh, why are all my ficus being attacked by everything all the time? Well, they happen to produce volatiles that attract, um, you know, inadvertently these different pests when in reality, those volatiles might serve a different function for the ficus and, or it may just produce them as just a byproduct of its own metabolism. Just like, you know, you and I sweat and we each have our own sense, you know, not yeah. for any particular reason. We just, smell Dude. a certain way mm -hmm. <laughs> and they pick up on that. So it, it, there's just a fascinating relationship right there um, with that. And I'll, I'll give one, one last example before we, uh, before we move on is okay. um, I love telling us it's the coffee example. 
coffee. Now, when we think of essential oils, I want everyone to think and remember the term secondary metabolites. These are all byproducts of the plant that are not really involved in photosynthesis. So we think of okay. primary metabolites as only things that are involved in photosynthesis. That's capturing the sun's energy, storing that energy as sugars, and then eventually breaking down those sugars and to using energy to produce the secondary metabolites, which are all the goody, the goodies that we know and love. So coffee, tea, um, you know, they produce caffeine. The coffee bean has a lot of caffeine in it. Did you know that the whole purpose of caffeine is to be a natural pesticide? The point of caffeine is when a bug bites into the coffee tree leaves, right? It's supposed to be overdosed and its heart is supposed to explode from the caffeine. But to you and... <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I wish I could make this up, but that's However. actually what the plant is trying to do. The plant is trying to kill the insect by making its heart explode. But, you know, you and I drink it, we just get a jolt because of the dosage and the size of us versus the size of the, uh, the insect, right? Like, I don't know if you've ever heard that old, like, that old wives tale of like one drop of concentrated pure caffeine or like two drops of concentrated pure caffeine will kill you. Mm hmm there's truth to that. You know, it, it's only a couple of drops of pure distilled essence of caffeine that will actually kill you too. <laughs> I believe it. I mean, there's, there have been one or two days of my life where I've had too many coffees and feel like my heart is going to explode. Oh yeah. I can definitely relate to that. <laughs>